up and running. You know, this drive. Again, there's no cost associated with subscribing except an investment of your time. And so far, it looks like quite a few of you have been investing your time, and I'm glad to see that. Continue to watch and make your inquiries regarding the issues raised. And when I said make your inquiries, I'll tell you about two phone calls that or so. Today, my guests and I, and by extension, you, family, my people, will reason about the latest news coming out of Jamaica and some other matters. As usual, we invite you to join and reason with us on the phone, and that number is 667-369-8569. Uh, Again, the number is 667-369-8569. Or you can hit us up in the, the now, please tune in to Reggae Global Radio, this station from midnight tonight until 2 a.m. and relax with the rebel, yours truly. This will be the fifth broadcast and I sincerely appreciate the support received thus far. Please continue to listen and I also encourage you to share the good news with your friends, relatives, and associates. Now, in recognition of February being Reggae Month, I played almost two hours of reggae music last week, Saturday night, into Sunday morning. And we had some technical difficulties. And those of you who stuck around caught the last hour. And of course, there was a bit of complaining. Um, some folks did not hear the message regarding the programming change. And so they were prepared, they were prepared for some cool jazz and slow jams. And, and they heard something else. Uh, well, tonight it's back to regular programming. So prepare for you. the people who call in, you know what I mean. Again, the program is the program is called Relax with the Rebel on the radio station. And it's tonight at midnight until 2 a.m. Get a date, be late. Today, I have a distinguished guest list to discuss newsworthy items coming out of Jamaica. I will be joined by my former national security community colleague, Herb Nelson, uh, later on. He's trying his, his, his best to come on as soon as possible. I think he'll, he'll be here about uh, 2.30 or so. My first guest will be attorney at law and president of the Senate, Tom Tavares Finson. My second hour guest will be Bobby Stevens, a consultant and spokesperson for Advocates Network. And my Third, our guest will be Senator Donna Scott Motley, an attorney at law and opposition spokeswoman for justice and gender affairs. I was expecting to have a mental health professional on the program today, but she couldn't attend due to circumstances beyond her control. But she has assured me that she'll be here next week. And again, you can't afford to miss that topic. Sure. Continued prayers and blessings from Eileen, Papa Trevor, Mappy, big up yourself and the family, Mrs. Nelson, Earl, Earl, and Sasadiva. Of course, a big shout out to my focus group and supporter. Thanks to all of you. Big shout out to the Reggae Global family, the Meadowbrook crew, the Firehouse crew, the Rollington crew, the crew of hardworking, dedicated, honest members of the JCF, including the chairman of the Police Federation, Mr. Ryan James. Mr. James, continue to represent and take care of your members, sir. Um, Kevin is there. Kevin? All right. Anyway, let me tell you about two phone calls I received within the last 12 hours. This morning at about two o'clock, I received a call from, it's a good thing to sleep. <laughs> you know, I received a call from a gentleman by the name of Hugo out of Kingston. And he had a lot to say. Um, uh, he was actually listening to a past program 
and I think he believed it was live. But he called in and, and he and I had a conversation for about 20 minutes and it was fruitful and worthwhile and I encourage him to listen today. Uh, he said he wanted to call, I hope he'll call and, uh, and listen as well. But he had some interesting views. Um, I would at this point reserve to express them for him because I think he's gonna call and then he can express them to the community at large. The second one was from a young lady by the name of Lisa. Um, again, very, very fruitful conversation. She had a lot to say. She's listening, I know. Uh, and I hope she'll chime in uh, in the chat room. Uh, ah, she's here already. Big up yourself, Lisa. And Erica, of course you're in the house. So, updates. Nothing to this one so at this point switches him over i'd like to just talk about our first our conversation with uh, mr tom tavares finson president of the senate and attorney at law um i was planning to have a discussion with him concerning civics because it's my understanding that civics is no longer being taught or no longer part of the regular curriculum and as a result of that you can see the effects of that because there are people in jamaica who don't even know how many members of parliament um, there are. Uh, they know very little about how parliament functions, how they make laws um, and things of that nature. And I felt it was worthwhile to have Mr. Uh, well, President Tom Tavares Finson uh, on the program to kind of give us a sense of how things are done in the, in, the, in the parliament, particularly the Senate, since he's a president there. But in our conversation this morning, he surprised me. He said to me, listen, uh, I am available to talk about anything, any questions you want to ask me, you or your, your, your listening audience, whoever said, just ask me, I'm ready to go. And I dare say that was very, very brave and courageous of him. But somebody who not, not here. So he's here. Um, Kevin, we just do just switching Mr. Tavares Finson over then. Um, we can start. Let me see. Well, I, I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear. There he is. I can yeah, hear good, you yeah. loud and clear, sir. I'm here. How are you? Good man. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you very much for having me as your guest for your first hour of your program. Mm -hmm. um, I took the liberty to spoke about, about um, looking at what your program is all about and your your the area to which you, you serve, the members of the diaspora that you serve. And the way to be here. Right. And I, I hope that I can bring some level that you want to discuss. And I, so I hope that the, the show goes well and, and people call. And as I said, I'm prepared to answer um, just about anything that I am in a position to do. Um, so, when you're ready, what I would do, if you don't mind, I'll just give you a brief over, overview of the legislative branch of the country. Please, and how for it. Yes, okay. So the legislative branch in Jamaica presently um, operates with the Governor General as the head of state. And that is something that, or representing the head of state, being Charles III, that is something that we, we certainly may take questions on because it is the view of many, many Jamaicans and it has been the view for a very long time. Um, I'm sure that many Jamaicans will remember that it was perhaps Michael Manley in the 70s that indicated that the government would move away from the monarchy and become a republic. And that really has been an agenda for a long time. Um, many people say that um, better, better we stay. Uh, others say, no, we have to uh, complete what they call the circle of our independence and become a republic. Well, the present government, um, through annualness, has indicated it is the intention of the... Sorry. I'm sorry about that. No worries, no worries. It is the intention of the government to move towards 
the Republican status and to replace the governor general with a president. So that is going to no doubt take some amount of, of discussion. Um, it requires a referendum. So it's not something that is going to be just done overnight. It's going to require a certain amount of, of preparation for the referendum and the holding of the referendum. And it is also a pretty costly process because um, you would know that all, all the paraphernalia of the monarchy that operate in Jamaica is going to have to change police uniforms, soldier uniform, the courts. Um, so anyway, so presently we operate with the governor general representing the monarch. Then there is the Senate, which comprises of 21 senators. The senators are appointed by the prime minister who, who appoints 13 and the leader of the opposition who appoints eight. So we have what is referred to as a bicameral system. The Senate is a chamber of review and it simply means that before legislation can become law it has to pass through the senate so it goes from the house of representatives to the senate and then to the governor general for signature and then it becomes law so the house of representatives which most people are acquainted with and interact with are 63 members of parliament and those are elected from the 63 constituencies in Jamaica. So we are divided into 63 constituencies and they elect, as you know, the general election, 63 members and the majority forms the government and the minority forms the opposition. So legislation will come to the lower house and it usually comes by way of policy of the government. So the cabinet would approve um, what is proposed legislation to go to the lower house, the House of Representatives for approval. It goes to the Senate. And normally the Senate will not interfere with policy, but will review the law to ensure that it is in keeping with the Constitution and that there are no issues outstanding in relation to that. And once that is approved, then it goes to the Governor General for signature. Mm -hmm. So that is basically the process by which legislation goes through. Well, let me, so, well, let me ask, they removed I think it's civics from, from, from the classroom um, as part of the regular curriculum. What is your view on that? Should it be reinstated or should things just go as, as they are right now? No, I think that not only should should it be um, reinstated, but there is a, a a view that we should be teaching also Garveyism, ah, mm -hmm. and I think that at the, 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 the movement towards reintroducing civics into the school and Garveyism is really going hand to hand because what you are trying to do is to raise a population of young kids who are not only highly self confident but also in a position to understand the world around them and what better way to do that than through values. Okay. Now, uh, let me ask you this, and I'm gonna, since you start talking about legislation and, and the like, let me ask you this question. In fact, people are writing in already with questions. Um, what one person uh, sent a question in, how can anyone's net worth rise so exponentially in politics when you're on a limited income for a short period of time. Now, before you answer that question, let me kind of set up the framework for it. Uh, it's, been, it's been noticed over the years that quite a few people enter into representational politics and they do so with very little net worth. Uh, in fact, some of them, as we just said in Jamaica, Brock, Brock Pocket. But after a few years, you start this note, you know, you start to notice the big cars, the houses, the trips, overseas investments, and so on and so forth. And it's been going on for a long, 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 just didn't start like within the last six or seven years or so. 
what, and I know that they have something called the Proceeds of Crimes Act. They also have a regulation whereby uh, parliamentarians have to uh, do financial disclosures. So we have laws in place. What do you say about the enforcement? And then I have, an, I have a follow-up question after. But what, what, uh, how do you address the issue of enforcement of these laws? Well, presently, there is an integrity commission that requires, um, in fact, not only politicians, but all senior um, persons within the civil service, within the police, within the military, to declare their assets on an annual basis. And those are monitored very closely by the Integrity Commission. We have a, a thing in Jamaica, you see, where no, I'm not suggesting that they have not, and maybe they are not corrupt politicians in the system. I'm not suggesting that. But we have the capacity to really belittle ourselves and to belittle our institutions. And we do so very with, with the greatest of ease and this one is a thief and that one is a thief and this one come into politics broke and all of a sudden him have money. Mm -hmm. And we and we tear down we tear down our systems and we tear down ourselves with this without the slightest of of, of people's reputation or um, for their for their contribution to the country. Mm -hmm. Many look let me tell you something. For every for every politician that a person point to and say, but what show this money? Money, you, you have another multi, multi set that leave the leave the, the politics broke, you know. So I, I'm sure that there are those who are corrupt. I'm sure that the level of corruption does not rise to persons' perception. And we put ourselves in a position in Jamaica where, you know, young people are not interested in, in going into politics because there is a view that every politician is a thief. And if you come to have a nice car, they must thief it. Mm -hmm. If you build a house, they must a thief something or the other. So, you know, the systems are in place. And I do not believe that the systems have ever been stronger in terms of legislation to deal with um, unjust in, or unexplained enrichment. enrichment and the processes that operate through the Integrity Commission, they have never been stronger. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the legislation is in place and um, it works. Yet still will people will have the perception that um, you come into politics with nothing and yet all of a sudden you have money. You know, I can't do anything about the perception that people have. But I, I do know that there are laws in place to do all right, let me give you, you, you talk about perception, and, and I think you're quite right uh, about that, but let me talk about reality. Okay. Right? The reality is that there's a gentleman by the name of Royal Reed, and he was caught with his, his hand in the cookie jar to speak, based on what we know at this point. It may turn out that he's, he'll be in, exonerated, but in the court of public opinion at this point, the man is as guilty as sin. Then we have the Petrojam scandal, Right? And we have a few others as well. So, and, and, and we expect our politicians to be free and far from corruption. So whenever you hear about as an instance, people tend to, and I agree, they tend to take it and, and, and paint everybody with a broad brush, but you cannot blame them because the expectation is that you go into politics, representational politics, politics, to represent your constituents, to do what's right, and to be honorable in doing so, and in ethical in doing so. So when we you have... Know, the, right. sorry, you, you know what, you know what you really, in fact, um, supported what I'm saying, mm -hmm. because in both of the areas that you have speak, that you have spoken about, matters that relate to issues current, I'm not speaking about Looks like we've lost. Are you, I can hear you. Oh, I think we've lost. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. I'm about. hearing you. Yeah, yeah. We just had um, Mr. Tavares Finston. I think we lost him. Um, let me go back. Uh, Kevin is not around right now. Hold on. Let me. Uh, 
I can't see any of your guests. No, I just lost him. Hold on a second. Um, okay, here we go. All right, let me move this over. Is here. All right. So, sorry for the uh, the tech problem. I think that was completely attributed to me. But some of you have heard what Mr. Tavares Finn's not to say so far. So, hit me up with some comments, phone call. Let me know what your feelings are so far about what he said. And uh, essentially, he's he's that you know uh, a, a lot of the uh, politicians they appear to be honest people, and so we are painting all of them with a broad brush and the feeling is that some of these folks they come into politics it was a, a few years they're wealthy um at lisa lisa put up a question and she said but who created this perception of politicians past behavior is a predictor of future behavior in fact nothing has changed and it's true i i think to a large degree the exposure that we're seeing now is unlike anything we've ever seen in the history of Jamaica. Because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, a lot of the things going on now would go uh, you know, undetected. Things would just happen. And even if they, even, and even if they happened and they were exposed, it, it, it would be for a very, very short period of time. And so people would just tend to, either they're not paying attention or they hear about it and they just don't have any interest and then they move on. So that is the problem with that. But today, it, it, you have so, with the internet, you have so many people now reporting on so many different things that it's hard for a politician to, to um, I see where he just called. Yeah, no, I'm sorry about that. And I was talking. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, we're, no, you're, you're, we're going to put push you over um, in a second. Yes. Uh, Kevin is working on it. Okay, okay. So there, it's a technical problem, not my issue. Actually, it's not a technical problem. It's a human problem. It's my problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, I hit the wrong button and so I disconnected you. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think Kevin is ready to move you over. Okay, there you go. All right, we're back. Live and direct with Mr. Our, how would you how would, how would you like to be referred to? Because I, I keep fascinating between <laughs> the president and senator and attorney at law. All right, you can pick your choice, and Tom will work too. All right, Tom. Uh, by the way, you have the gentleman that you see next to you, that's Herb Nelson, a former colleague of mine in the US intelligence community. Um, right. I I uh uh Mr. Senator. You can uh, call him Tom. You see, you're struggling too with a uh, title frame. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Tom, go ahead. Finish up the point you were making about. You said I, I was in agreement with the point you were making about. Uh, yes, no. What, what, what? You, you, the two examples that you use as really as relates to recent what you refer to as, as scandals. Um, those both both of those matters are before the court. Right. So both of them have been have been in relation to read. He's charged with another, and they are in the high um, parish court. And the principles from Petrojam that were implicated are before the court as well. Mm -hmm. So in as much as you can say that they are, there is corruption within the system, and there is no system of human beings that doesn't have corruption in it, in relation to the two matters that you pointed to, they are before the court. So what I was saying earlier is that there are systems in place to deal with corruption generally. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it appears, at least in some instances, to be working. But let me ask this. I heard there was a jumping other question. You know, that's on the topic of corruption. Let's go to something even more recent than, than, than uh, the Petrojam and the Ministry of Education scandal. Let's talk about the scandal that, uh, and I say scandal 
something it's fascinating that recently came out came out within the last several days uh but something that actually happened in you know over a period of year the minister as i i, I and, and look, you're an attorney, so you'll 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 tread carefully. You'll know you know what you can say, what you can't. Say. You won't even have to set the guardrails. No, and furthermore, setting up any guardrails. Um, once again, you have a situation where the processes set up under law appear to work. However, you have an instance in this particular case where. There are some um, unfortunate developments that come out of the system, which is the Integrity Commission. So let me just tell you very briefly the, the, what, what happened in this particular instance. The Integrity Commission is looking at, looks at all public servants, not only politics, members of the Jamaican Constabulary and so on. And in 2007, 2007, we are in 2022. In 2007 and 2008, I believe, when the Prime Minister at the time was an opposition member of Parliament, he recommended a contractor, um, recommended a contractor to be given work in his constituency. And I should point out that it is not suggested that he, as a member of parliament, gave anybody any contract. That's not the suggestion. Mm -hmm. He recommended a contractor. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody who knows anything about politics in Jamaica knows that it is not unusual for a member of parliament to recommend a contractor to get work in his constituency. For example, if you are in South St. Andrew, Arnett Gardens, or you are in Western Kingston, the member of parliament recommends contractors who work in his, con work in his constituency. You, know, you don't expect the person to, to recommend a contractor from Port Antonio to go and work in Denham Town in West Kingston. Mm -hmm. So that's just an aside. So the allegation was, listen to the allegation, in 2006, 2007, when the prime minister recommended a person for a contract, he did so because the person was his friend. So it is considered to be uh, undue influence or whatever. However, it is not that the prime minister who, well, member of parliament at the time, gave anybody a contract because he wasn't in a position to do so. So he remained the person, and the person would have gone through the processes, his contract, um, general's uh, requirements, and so on. So at this point in time, in 2022, 23, an investigation in relation to wholeness as to how it was, or who it is that he recommended um, this contract to. So it goes to the it goes to the integrity commission who investigated. Now recognize this. That's the job of the integrity commission. Because somewhere along the line, maybe somebody bring it to their attention and say, look here, this contractor has been given quite a bit of work in Polis's constituency. It must be some form of corruption. And they investigated notwithstanding the fact that it's been years ago or whatever it is and that's their job to do so investigate they come up with a report that says these are the facts and these facts are to be sent to the director of prosecutions in the integrity commission so it's two, it's two, two documents that if you want to look at it in terms of documents, there are two documents. The report about these contracts given, and that report is sent to the legal officer, the officer who is responsible for prosecution. When that officer, and we only know this now because these documents have become public, 
when that officer looks through or looked through the documentation, she her ruling was that there is nothing criminal in this report and that there is no prosecution to be done of wholeness. Okay, so there are two documents. There is one, the document of the investigation, which they admit to their internal prosecutor. It's not a prosecutor outside of their department, you know. It's a prosecutor within the Integrity Commission because they have their own prosecutorial department. And so write a document and say, I have examined the document concerning the allegations to wholeness. There is nothing here to prosecute. Okay, so the Integrity Commission has two documents. The Integrity Commission then puts the first document before the court that says, we have investigated this issue and we have de decided that the Prime Minister is to be referred to prosecutorial department for Of course, it creates quite a hullabaloo, not only locally, but internationally. And the Integrity Commission did that when they, the Integrity Commission, had their own analysis from their own prosecutor saying there is nothing here to prosecute. So they put the matter before the parliament and them say, oh, the prime minister is going to be referred for prosecution. They don't say, and this is the report, we referred it to prosecution for prosecution, and the prosecutor said that there is nothing here. And they did that when they had the report from their own prosecutor for almost a year. And that is what has now created, if you want to refer to it as a crisis, it is a crisis of confidence in the Integrity Commission of Jamaica. Because people say, you investigated Mr. Holness thoroughly, you submit the investigation, and your own legal people say there is nothing to prosecute. And yet still, you put it in the public domain that the man is set up is likely for prosecution. And that is why now all the, the civil society organizations, PSOJ, uh, Mr. Trevor Monroe's Integrity Action Commission, and so on. And in fact, the People's National Party themselves um, are, are questioning the way in which the Integrity Commission went about this thing. And just, just in closing, and I'll take any question you have on it, the danger of it is that you set up systems Systems like that the operative people have confidence in them, you know. And that is one of the things that that's that's the nature of a democracy. You give people authority and they exercise authority only to the extent that people have confidence in, in them. And we know that you have a police force, for example, and unless the citizens don't have confidence in them, they, they, then they don't get any cooperation or information. So that is the danger of going ourselves in Jamaica now. Okay. So you use the word, the latest scandal involving the Prime Minister. It might be more correct to say the scandal involving the Integrity Commission. Resignation is um, resignation of our certainly some investigation into the way in which the electoral, I'm sorry, the way in which the Integrity Commission went about this matter. Okay, before I, or, I, I, I'll ask you the question. Uh, have you read the full report? I, I think you have, right? Yes? Um, let me put it this way. Um, to the extent that um, um, no, I've not read it okay. fully, but uh, I'm well aware of the contents. Of because it. I, I've read There's it. There's an explanation why I've not read it. But so. Okay. I, I, I have read it. Um, and there are some things that I could take objection to, some of the facts that you mentioned. Um, but what I'd do at this point, because it's not fair to you since you haven't read the entire report to ask you. No, but you no, know, man, you can't, what, what you can't, what you cannot take, what mm -hmm. you cannot take, um, issue with 
Mm -hmm. The fact that their prosecutor said that there is nothing to prosecute, we can't but, take issue with that. Yeah, but here's the thing. I'm looking at these things. I'm looking at the facts as, the, as, as provided by the investigative arm of uh, the Integrity Commission. And they look pretty damning to me. And I don't think anybody's saying, I haven't heard one person say, you know what? Those facts are incorrect. And that's why I'm saying it's unfair to you. Since you are the entire, I would like you to report to look at the facts as alleged by the. the no, the, but I know, I know what the facts are alleged. I know what they are. Okay, so, so if you have the question, if you have the question that you want to ask, all right, hold on a second. I don't want to dominate this because there are other people wanting to. Ask. Herb, go ahead with your question, please. Okay. Uh, look at uh, some background that I gleaned from the 18 degrees north report uh, right she's uh, assessing that the expose in 2016 had initially concluded that mr holness may have influenced the awarding of government contracts to westcon construction limited whose principals robert garvin and donovan simpson had been known to him for over 20 years and had business dealings with him. And Mr. Garvin was a business associate of him. If you recall, there was a direct tie-in to properties that Mr. Holness had um, uh, acquired in, in the Beverly Hills uh, community. So, you not... Uh, uh, and now here, uh, Mr. Ratigan applying to be police commissioner. And without the recommendation of the prime minister that he be selected, he both simply just blew by his um, outstanding um, CV and selected who, who, whomever he wanted to, to be to select, which in this case, current commissioner of police who himself was retired chief defense force and the current national i'm just giving you that analogy because you will see the importance yourself and yeah, yeah you know i have to tell you i'm just speaking for your no, listeners no problem yeah your listeners uh are looking at this and say wait a second the pm says something and the uh, the public no, service me, commission can go along. One minute, just listen to you. Okay. Every of parliament, every one of the sixty-three members of parliament is entitled. In fact, they are required to make recommendation for contract work, which is done in their constituency. And when you're talking about the prime minister, the prime minister did not make any recommendation. This was when he was a parliament. In fact, an opposition member of parliament. So you need to get that clear. It's not a situation where he, you are saying, oh, the prime minister, so they would have to go with him. This was when he was a member of parliament, not the prime minister. So that's just a point of information. Sorry to disturb you. I won't no, disturb you again. No problem. But OK, at the time, he was an influential member of parliament. Let's put it that way. I want to put it that way. He was a member of parliament. OK. That the other 63 of them. But this gentleman that he recommended, he had other questionable dealings with because what, what kind of questionable dealings? Man is a contractor. Okay. You, it, see, it, you see, you, you use words, and and those those words carry weight. He had okay. questions. Yeah, but but all right. Then let, let me finish. And then, and then you understand. No, but you see, I, I I have to interrupt you when you say like, okay, he has a contractor who has he has made a recommendation about. Okay. Bear in mind, well, bearing in mind that the prosecutors at the Integrity Commission have said there is nothing to prosecute. And you are now saying, oh, there are questionable connections. I don't, I'm not, I can't buy that. I can't, I can't sit and listen to that. Okay. The basis I'm using 
is the 18 degrees north Zara Burton interview. Yes, but look, excuse me, 18 degrees north, I, I respect them and all of that, but they are just an, another um, news outlet. You, you make it sound like they are the authority in all things. i give you a firmer reference. At around the same time that that was disclosed, the Cyberpol, which is an international cyber policing organization, had done an extensive research and investigation. And Cyberpol came up with the very same factor that Ms. Burton had disclosed on our program with the Prime Minister. Words, well, hold on, what, what very same factor? Unexplained affluence unexplained wealth and, and uh, so it was yes the prime minister is required to make um submissions on an annual basis he would have been required to do that on a annual basis as mp yes as a source of income where i'm getting income from his wife happens to be, both of them have, have businesses, his wife is involved in construction. And, I, I, you know, there has been nothing to suggest that his income is direct, that is, his funds, are, the source of them are illegal. So if you want to go and use the canard, Oh, because in Billows, because in born in a board house in Saint, in Spanish town, and in Billa Big House, if you call it that, in Beverly, it must be a thief. I can't support that. Well, uh, I'm not saying that outright, but you know, you have a. No, a but you say you qualify, you qualify it and say outright. You are not saying that outright. So you are saying it. What I'm, I'm, saying is I'm a certain fact that like a good lawyer would, right? It, no. Because in born in a Spanish tongue in a board house, if he went to university and qualified himself, he's married to a woman who is in construction who has built many um, schemes in Kingston. But you're not saying it outright, but it shouldn't be lost of Beverly Hills. I'm not buying that. There is any question that he is involved in corruption. And I can tell you, he has been the subject of every scandal allegation in Jamaica, and he has been the subject of every investigation, and they have come up with nothing. And people go on platform and say, what oh, him a bill, big house? He, he, he have the money, he's entitled to build a bill out, big house. And because he's born in a board house in a, in a um, Spanish town, people think he shouldn't have money. I don't support that. I am not supporting that either. Yes, you're there. supporting it because you're no, saying No, no, I'm, saying, I'm not. I, 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 I'm giving... Not saying, that you're saying it. if there is evidence that the man is corrupt, send it and give it to the Integrity Commission. With this, send it to the police. It, it was sent to the Integrity Commission. And this the Integrity is, Commission says, in relation to this matter, there is nothing to prosecute. Well, well, they they're not talking about the stuff that was sent them concerning Mr. Garvin and and the um, the Saint Lucia uh, transfer of funds from Mexico City. You, you you can't, you can't, man. You can't draw me in that. I, I'm not drawing you in. I'm just, I'm just saying, I have foundation. You have come like out to come talk about St. Lucia and, and Mexico money. I don't know nothing about that. Okay. And if there is any evidence of it, no doubt, the Integrity Commission will deal with it. But I, I hope they will deal with it in the long term. So, so until yeah. then, big man, man, all I, you know, you have to are um, within a, a certain level of intelligence because they are here participating in the program, right? They just come on the program and I say, oh, man, transfer money from St. Lucia, you know. Man, transfer funds from St. Lucia. If you have the evidence, put it before the court or put it before the Integrity Commission and let them act on it. Okay. Don't come on a throw forward and a throw Okay, I, I don't throw words, sir. Nothing. What I'm saying to you is... Yes. Man, a commitment to ask the Integrity Commission to disclose 
or say what has happened to the evidence presented to them no, but I, from I Cyberpol. Yeah. You know who the integrity commission is? Greg. No, it is a director. We had President Buffy, Mr. Justice Pantan, Mr. Justice Hibbert, and a whole litany, litany of persons of the highest caliber. You send information to give them according to you. I assume that they have investigated it. Don't come and ask me about it. I can ask Mr. Mr. Justice Pantan about it. Okay, so, you know, this is the very problem that we have asserted all along, that the members of the party itself have to hold all their and this just, it didn't just concern the, the current prime minister when, you know, when he was in education. It concerns, you know, several members of that executive that were investigated at the time. Like who? Well, well, I, you know, again, I don't want to cast aspersions out there. No, but you can't. You're not willing to listen. A bit, you can't, if you if you're upon a situation, you're upon a course where you cast aspersions. Just cast aspersions for no oldness, but you're not cast aspersions for nobody else. Because he's the leader, he's the current leader of the party that yeah, this information. Leader, hold on a little bit. You have current leader of other party that were involved in, 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 in situation. You could have cast aspersions from them too. Well, so into the line and a fear in a fear and, and non partisan way, do that, but don't come and say we are true. But you don't give me a chance to get say you will not interrupt. Hold on, let me let me jump in here for a second. Uh, Tom, you, you mentioned that um, it is the duty of every member of parliament to recommend. Uh, construction work in constituency. Is, uh, am I correct in, in saying that's what you said? Can you say that again? No, so, no, I never said no, construction so, work. All right. I said, I remember, Father, 63 of them, where there is work to be done in their constituencies, mm -hmm. they are entitled to, they do, and in fact, it is their duty mm -hmm. to make recommendations to the contractor in their constituency. It does not mean that if that contract does not meet the qualifications that is laid out by the contractor general, if all their work programs are not up to scratch, if they are not the appropriate, in other words, look here, what I'm trying to say to you, no member of parliament could have said, road is going to be built in my, con in my constituency, make we recommend Tom Finson. Because I'm not a contractor, I don't have I don't have the relevant documentation. The, the member of parliament does not give the contract. He says, if you are building this road, I'm going to recommend this contractor who is acquainted with the constituency, him know the lay of the land in the constituency, him working in the constituency already. His work has been very good. Every member of parliament did. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Is it is it protocol then? for a member of parliament to recommend work to be done in another member's constituency? Because you, you talk about that member uh, uh, recommending uh, uh, contractors for work to be in his or her constituency. But okay, if a member of parliament, mm -hmm. right? If I am talking to a member of parliament, and you member of Alex door, for you to recommend somebody to get work in my constituency would have to be with my agreement. <laughs> Okay, so can we say then that the recommendations made by the Prime Minister at the time for work to be done in St. Anne, Falmouth, St. Mary, St. Uh, Andrew, and uh, a few other places that they're not in his constituency? Is it? No, 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 I'm asking. Well, no, but you're not listening to what I'm no, telling you. I, I heard exactly what In you said. Anybody, oh. look here. Me, Tom Finson, mm -hmm. can write to the KCC and say, look here, I am recommending John Brown to work any which way. It, the, the question is not the recommendation, you know. When you recommend the person, it don't mean the person go to the ministry and sign the documentation. You know? no. Does not mean that. No, 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 no. And no. It, look here. So let me ask, let me tell you something. If what you are saying, 
that when he was a member of parliament, he recommended to get work. There is no, there is, there cannot be an issue with it. You yourself, Mr. Ratican, could recommend somebody. It is not the recommendation that it, that the issue, as the prosecutor point out from the integrity commission, is not the recommendation. Right. What your what your previous guest is saying is that no, I am being disingenuous because once the person recommends, then the person is going to get the contract. That's not so. And certainly not from well, the first point. Well, you know what I wanted to explore the law with you. Um, the law concerning conflict of interest and whether what, what a minister should or, or MP should or should do. And all right, go ahead, go ahead. Where do you find the law concerning conflict of interest? Well, I'm going through the report here, and the investigator, the, the 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 integrity commission investigator, he mentioned it in several places. He talks okay. about so he talks he, about. He, I, I, hold on, hold on. You asked me a question. Let me tell. You. Yeah. He, he talks about it in uh in four section four point six point forty one, where he talks about a conflict of interest exists when a government uh, uh government of Jamaica personnel involved in a procurement process. He talks about it extensively. Ah, but hold on a little bit. Listen to me. That's what I've been trying to get across to you. Recommendation is not involving yourself in the procurement process. Right. But he, but here's the thing. If you if you write a letter, let's talk about the weight. Oh, I think we're running we're we're coming up on the commercial break. But big man, we now start talking us and nobody got to no commercial. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love your attitude. I love your spirit. No, but you see, but here how you shift again. You see, you and your guests and they get on top of this thing. You know? No man. Here how you shift again now. You're not talking about men anymore. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You're I'm... talking about hold on. Mm -hmm. You shift from gone from recommendation to the weight of the recommendation. That you're going to, you know. No, but hold on a second. Hold on so a second. If I recommend any of, you, mm -hmm. any of your people, any of your persons listening to me, better ask your question. I'm going to ask two questions. We're coming up on the commercial break. Yeah, but yeah, that, that, we're going to talk to the break. Go ahead. That, no, man. No, why are you listening to them here? Me not talk to you. No, 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 no. But what I'm saying is that we're going to, we're going to have a break. But go ahead. Talk to, talk to. What I have to ask you, anybody, you could have 300 contractors in Jamaica. If Mr. Mark Golden and Arnett Gard decide to pave the road as Zimbabwe, you think anybody can go up there and work unless the contractor acquainted with the place? Mm -hmm. You think any contractor can go and work in a West Kingston in a Tivoli Gard with, with Edward Boulevard? That's what I'm don't want to go down there. But so when there is a contract running in Mr. Mark Golden constituency or Mr. Mackenzie constituency, and then said there is a piece of road to fix, and the apartment this contract I recommend. Of course, it's going to be taken into consideration. Ah, there there is that. That so, but see now, you just come around to my point now about weight, about the weight of the recommendation. You just admitted to that. You just admitted to that. But brethren, I'm not saying that there is no question of no. No, weight. But, I'm but, but, no but here's what you said a while ago. Before no, before you made that, before you made that statement, you but, said but, to me that let us, be, let us be realistic, the man. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. stick up, stick up in. Uh, no, stick up in, stick up in. No, stick up in. Before we, before we said to me that we had shifted the conversation from the recognition to the weight, but you just said, yes. of course the weight, the weight, the weight carries, carries so, uh, some when I, consideration. When I, said, when I say you shifted it and, and insert weight into it, I wasn't suggesting that you weren't wrong. I never suggest you're wrong. I simply uh, point out to you that you have put weight in it now. Yeah, but you admit now that weight is in it. Weight is in it. But big man, if you are the member of parliament, mm -hmm. let us let, let us shift it a little bit. You are Mark Golden, right? You're going to carry a contractor from Port Antonio to fix the road up and on again in a Zam, Zam, um, Zimbabwe front part. Eh? But listen, if, if answer that question, make a here. No, I will do that. But here's the thing: if you go list of the law, that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about you're talking about facts. You're talking about reality. That's what you're talking about. No, I'm not. You are, there's a there's a procurement. There's a procurement process. A recommendation. A recommendation from you or the Bishop of Kingston 
or the member of parliament. That recommendation triggers only the interest of the procurement process. It cannot influence the situation to the extent where you say this man who have no experience with Bill Road can get no contract. It don't work so. All right. Let me read you something. Let me read you something. All right. And like I said, I didn't want to do this because I don't think it's... No, man. You do, man. All right. Good. Since well, you give me permission. It says here that... It says here that government are uh are expected to adhere and which should govern the activities of the government your day-to-day -day business these principles include um self selfless hold of public office judged solely in terms of the public interest it is an offense to do so in order to gain financial or other materials your families and friends now that recommendation with that wit it allowed that contractor no, but fact. hold on, brethren, hold on a little bit. What you are what you are assuming, you know, that the man recommended recommend John Brown because he's his friend, not because he is a contractor with relevant work history, the relevant certificates, and all the relevant um qualification and Get contract huh? and Jordan could even no contract nowhere in Jamaica because I'm not a contract. Okay, listen to what right? yeah, no, I'm not reading. So, no, but hold on, 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 year in year out and doing good work and it so happened that you and him become according to you friend if you start being contract no it depends no it depends on what the contract is all about and it then only that and you always say if you must stop giving contract so that the mp cannot 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 each contract you just said you said that before it cannot issue right no contract. right what so, should have said. What, so, what so that's have a false said. premise then the question that you just you asked no what I was a misspeak. What I okay. should have said is that you are stopped from the contract because no. you want him to start to treat Here's what right here's what uh, here's question here's what I'm referring to. Just read it. It is an offense to do so in order to gain financial or other material benefits for themselves, their families, and friends. And he admitted that this man was a friend of his. So for so him we're... for him then, for him then to make that recommendation that carries such great weight, right? It would be unreasonable for us to believe. But no, you don't know. <laughs> you can't get out of this. Right. <laughs> you, just put, you just put great on the way. But, 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 I, I gave you the instance of the selection for the commissioner of police. And Mr. Rattigan, see your just the current. And, and the weight, the weight, you acknowledge that the weight was there. You didn't, you didn't oppose it. That's that's one of the very rare things he never posed. No, but here what happened. You see, as far as the appointment of the police commissioner is concerned, yeah. ins and out of that, to be quite honest with you, I don't I don't really know about it, nor do I really follow it. I know that some very qualified people apply. I noticed that I know that there are some very qualified people um who uh, come up through the service. Um and I know that there's something the police services commission which i be responsible for the appointment for this commission i'm not really not more but, but as a citizen of jamaica aren't you concerned that the the failures the consistent failures of police commissioners is impacted the country in a very negative way um is it, it is is something to be taken like it is a very serious matter and i you know we could have a discussion about the question of crime and violence and the way in which the government goes about trying to deal with it we could have that discussion i hold my breath because since the implementation of a number of strategies recently some of which have not been supported by the society. And in fact, the courts have said that some of them are unconstitutional. But 
there was a 25% reduction of serious crime in the month of January. 25%. Now, whether that is just a glitch or is it the result of strategies which are bearing fruit, investment in the intelligence aspect of the police force, you will notice over the last couple of, well, certainly last month, there have been a number of major busts of funds coming into the port. Is this reduction a, a, a glitch on the um, screen? I hold my breath to hope that what is happening here now is the increase in penalties of gun, mandatory 15 years minimum for illegal possession of firearm, mandatory 45 years coming up for murder. Uh, is it that the strategies are bearing fruit? I don't know. I, as a Jamaican, I must tell you, and somebody who lives in Jamaica, I really hope that we are seeing um, some change in the, in, the, in, the, in the landscape as it relates to crime. The, the, the one thing I, I think I need to insert in your um, conversation about the disclosures is that which disclosure the, about what now? The, the financial disclosures are the disclosures, disclosures that, that, <laughs> that anybody in the PNC no, 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 no. This concerns no, both the PNC and the police and the crime thing, and you're going back to Mr. Holness. No, Look, <laughs> but if you said something that the public know to be slightly inaccurate, yes, talk would you want to know? Yes. Okay. So what I'm saying to you is how long did it finally take, even after the NIA went to court? For the the leader of the opposition and the prime minister to make any declaration publicly of the situation, and isn't something still pending concerning your PM? Oh no, Mister 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 um, Trump, not put in financial records. No, 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 no. Hold on a second. No, no, no. Hold on a second. You know, me now make you get away that. Hold on a second. No, no, no. me now make you. No, me now make you get away that. As to what, as to what, as to what the, um, as to what the integrity commission is requiring the prime minister to do and what he's not requiring not to do, I don't know. I'm digging an out of that, but I'm sure it's been taken care of. You certainly get quiet now to me call up Mr. Trump, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No man. And you don't have no radio license, so you suppose you can talk. <laughs> no, we have radio license, man. We do. Look, we do. It, what it comes down to is that all filings were missed by both parties. And even after your leader filed his, it turns out that for 2021 to now, he, he hasn't been able to file anything else. So, so let me ask you a question. Look at how yeah. this thing is working. You know more than me. You know that the Prime Minister don't file in 2021 or not file it completely as a case. Coming so from this, NIE, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Monroe. The system not working, man. The system working, you know. Because if you know that, and Dr. Monroe, Trevor Monroe, my friend, Trevor, as I call Trevor, if he, if he, know, if he knows that, then the system not working, man. That is what you call oversight. You know? No, but here's the thing. No, no, no. We can't make you get away that so the system working. Can't make you get away that. I mean, after all, he's the leader of our country. And so you expect certain behavior from the leader of our country. You don't expect that he's not... I I'll give you an example. I'll give you an no, example. No, but hold on a little bit. No, man. You yeah, tell me, hold on. No, no, no. no hold on. No, Tom. 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 Hold on. No, Tom. No. Hold on. No. Tom. Tom. Hold on. Listen. As an FBI agent, I was required to file two financial disclosures every yes, year. Yes, me too. Right. Me filing right. every year. Right. And guess what? Guess what? Severe consequences if you didn't file on time. Because in, in, in one instance, like the, the second one, which is very, very intrusive, they would give you notice months in advance. And they remind you like every week, hey, don't forget this. Don't forget you have to file. 
So if you didn't file, there'd be hell to pay. So yeah, I can't make you get to answer that the system know. work because the system, no, no, is that no, it's a backhanded way that I'm saying that the system work because the way the system work is that he should have filed. But you know, if him don't file, I'm filing. They said that he, they said that, that who is there? Oh, you mean the people responsible for, for overseeing this? Who are the people? Or, or better yet, or better, I'll give you one better than that. They said that they who cannot they? certify, they cannot certify what he's put down on paper. Yeah, because that means that they are discussing it. Maybe him put down something that they disagree or he put down something that they disagree. Look, look, you're as, as, Tom, as a leader, and you know this. You're supposed to be above no, and man. beyond. Well, no, no, you're supposed to be no, above man. and beyond reproach. You're gone, you're gone. No, no, you're no, gone no, no. No, 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 no. I'm just following you, you know. I'm following your lead. I'm following your lead. No, man, I'm following your lead. I'm following your lead. You're gone from something from 2000 and 2006 when the man was a member of parliament. Yes. Talk about him big house in Beverly Hills. Yes. And you come now to say, that in integrity commission is saying that they cannot certify they cannot certify what he has filed so he has filed it so no, no i don't well, see what the problem is no no hold on a second you said that we come from 2006 or 7 and now we come to present what does that tell you then if you can talk about a man with all of these allegations going back from then to now what does that tell you I, tom you know this and hold on i don't hear that but hold on hold on, hold on a second hold on hold on i don't hear that about you i don't hear that about you you know why you don't i don't hear that about you. <laughs> and you're a leader you're a leader smart. in the senate <laughs> you're a leader in the senate i don't hear none i don't hear none of them allegations about you i hear other things but no, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I submit that we should have a change of leadership there yeah I, I, let me talk I, yeah tom you know what tom, you know, tom? See who are doing okay, anything bad for about you as far as government okay. is concerned, right? What we need to do is, but maybe you need to take over the, the helm. There you in go. In case you don't know, in case you don't know, it's for election, you run at Jamaica and lose, right? Uh -huh. and you may, and people are not interested in me as an elected representative, so I'm fine. Well, the fifth time is a charm, <laughs> considering what's going on right now. Anyway, we're joined by Bobby Stevens. I don't know if you know him, Tom, but he's a very dear friend of ours. You know him? Let me look on him, good. Robert, <laughs> yeah, man. Same man. Okay, all right. In my right to one, I'm a very good friend. Family. Robert Stevens and I are essentially. Family. Oh, you know what I thought you were going to say? Did, I thought you were going to say. Him on the program to fool around him. No, 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 no. Actually, that wasn't the plan, but because this, the, the conversation is going so well with you, the plan was you'd leave and then he would come. But since you're here, I I thought you were going to say to one of your girlfriends. I thought that's what you were going, but anyway. No, uh, in my right to one, I'm a sister best friend. Okay, all right. Uh, okay. No. Here's what I'd like to do, because we, we had a fun time with you a while ago. I'd like you to stick around because the questions are coming in for you, but I don't want to shortchange, Bobby. Don't go no. anywhere. No, you have to come back next week because you know that I'm not. Let, let me just indicate to, to um, your, your listeners that I'm not actually, as we speak here now, as I'd said to you earlier, mm -hmm. You're I'm out of the island on yeah. an emergency. Okay. And that is why when you asked me a while ago, earlier on, if I had read the report cover to cover, I did um, confess and say I did not. But it's not because of a failure to take my my work seriously, but I am traveling on a, on a family. All right. I'll tell you what. People here are asking all kinds of questions. Are Will you make a commitment to come back next week, Saturday? 150%, but not if Bobby Stevens is on the program. Oh, yeah, run from Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll tell you what. You're free to go, so but we're gonna hold you to this, and uh, I'll be in touch with you, and we will link up next week Saturday. Yeah, man, thank you very much. And as I said to to your your listeners, um, were it not the fact that I'm not, I have some issues here dealing with overseas. So, we're, we're, one last question, Tom. Uh, yes. Is Tavares family in Saint Mary? Do you know? The no, you know the the Tavares that I'm from are actually from. A place in Westmoreland, Georges Lane. Okay. And, and then we are also related to the Tavarises in Port Royal. So Tavares is, ah, Bobby. Bobby is Mr. Port Royal. I think that the Tavares, the Tavares name is actually a member of one of the original Brotherhood of, um, names of Port Royal. So yeah, it's, I, uh, I ask because my, on my mom's side is uh, Tavares. Uh, yeah, it's the same one, man. It's we, man. I say your company really don't have text set for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you must know. know, know I know. You know, I know it's a real parish. 
Took care. God bless and thank you. All God right. God. Keep well, my brethren. Right. Take care of your business. Good. All right. All right, folks. That was a lively discussion we had with Tom. As he said, we, 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 we should call him. And uh, he'll be back next week. Uh, I'm sure next week when he comes back, he, you know, he, he will have a great report. But we can delve into uh, the subject a bit deeper. And we'll, pro and we'll have more time for the question and answer session. Anyway, at this point, we're joined by Robert. Spokesman, he's done my trade. Uh, I think he was a, a, a high rank. He's all I wanted to spoke uh, uh, advocate. And what we would like is all the prime uh, influence on the contract or procurement procedure. But Bobby, uh, welcome to the program. What I'd like you to do before we start is just give a sense of who you are to the listeners. Well, I think a lot of people know me as associated with the, first of all, I was director of tourism for Jamaica and I was involved in the bauxite alumina industry. I've been involved in agro-industry and most of the rest of the things I've done are tourism related. For instance, the, we had a plan for the development of Port Royal as a major tourism hub because it is really a heritage site that needs to be exposed to the world. So those are some of the things I've been involved in. Nowadays, I'm giving a lot of advice to investors about doing their investments in a sustainable fashion and making sure that they benefit the people of Jamaica. Okay, no, we just had a uh, Tom. Uh, we were specifically the recent saga with the prime minister involved in the procurement process. What I'd like you to do for our audience is give them a sense of corruption in general, and then record this particular, uh, uh, the most recent event involving the uh, the prime minister. Well, I. I I feel very strongly that we have had too many cases of clear corruption or issues where government or public sector agents have dipped their fingers into the pie in terms of taxpayers' money. And it has been something that has been happening for forever, almost. And one of the things is that we need to get rid of this type of approach to, to governance. Mm -hmm. We need to begin to get politicians to recognize that really there are two arms that need to be separated. One is the administrative arm and the other is the political arm. The political arm needs to deal more with policy and with the laws of the country. But they shouldn't get involved in choosing contractors and employees and deciding who is to go where because that way you you taint it with political appointees mm -hmm. and 90 percent of the time when you put a political appointee in place they believe that because you are the prime minister appointed them or gay brat they can do you no know, mm -hmm. and it really is something we need to get away from Cases where I have certainly been involved in creation. You had criteria for it in order to submit a So may have done a track record, etc. So before they can and if they don't meet criteria, they can be. Mm -hmm. So it, it immediately removed. The second thing is that you then that technical side of the pro as well as the financial side. And from a management perspective, a decision about who is the best contractor to be chosen. 
when you get politics involved, the, a politician will tell you, boy, this is my good friend, or he is somebody who work or, or whatever. I want you to choose him. That immediately compromises the position. And what we need to do is get away from the constituent all the cases where politicians involved getting contractors or are choosing people for jobs away from it totally. Let me and let this more, you know, from a more the Tom was home phrase document process. I don't want to speak for him, but I believe he was saying that the prime minister who was then uh, in, a, in a lesser position involved in procurement simply by ending somewhere. Let me tell you, the moment a politician recommends somebody, it compromises the position. Because the people who are choosing feel obligated to give some kind of preferential treatment to who the politician has recommended. And that is PNP or GLP or PIP. The reality is that they should stay far away from choosing people for jobs or for contracts or things like that, because it compromises the professionalism associated with contractors or people. Uh, I hear you, Russell. but if you they're involved in the selection process, then that would be a violation. And what Tom was saying was that you don't make a recommendation, you're not a procurement process. It's just simply that a recommendation, albeit a recommendation that carries heavy weight, as you were saying. And so politician says this, it's tantamount, you know, to a directive. But if you look at the 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 the, the letter of the of the of the regulation, it 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 doesn't seem as if it would include him. And I, I'm I'm just saying this to to provoke your thought. What do you think about that? If it doesn't well, if it doesn't go that far let, to include him, let me tell you. Look here, when this particular case, what was presented was a lot of evidence that indicated that the, the whole process was probably compromised. However, what the legal opinion was is that it cannot be made as a, a case for, for charging somebody with corruption, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, it, it's a very difficult thing to prove. Right. However, my argument is that in spite of all of that, we as a country need to get away from politicians getting involved in selecting contractors or people for jobs. If you look around right now in many public sector organizations, the people who are in the top positions are people who have been either recommended or anointed or chosen or whatever by politicians. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is not the way you should be choosing the people who are for top jobs in the public sector. What you should be doing is looking at their track record, looking at their experience, looking at the type of job that needs to be done, and choosing the best person. Not because they are a PNP or a JLP or whatever kind of P. Well, let me put it to you like this. In one instance, right? In one instance, there, there was no one the requirements because they had to have been registered with a certain agency and they had to have a certain num uh, a certain ID number or something like that. And one of the things that I said is that there was they, they, he had to pay the um the the Christmas the workers who did the Christmas job. He had to pay them because they had work and they were paid five days before Christmas. And so he wrote this letter. And essentially what he was saying is that there's no one that could could that that the agency could pay, could give the money to, to, to disburse it to these workers because no one qualified except one 
it just so happened it's just this one company, the company that he was associated with, a friend with whom he also has a business uh, uh, arrangement. They sat on boards and all of this stuff. So, uh, I mean, how do you handle a situation like that where in order for monies to be disbursed to pay these workers, it has to go to someone who is qualified? And there's only one on that list. Yeah, but if to do the work had been tendered in the normal way and you choose the right contractor to do the you have found yourself in a nice position. Very good point. Point well taken. So I'm I'm just saying that we, we really need to pull away from the practice which has been around forever, where politicians, in my opinion, interfere in the business of getting the people's work done. Politicians must stick with policy and stick with putting in place the, the laws and the regulations and all that of how things should be run. But don't get involved in the day-to-day -day operations and day-to-day -day running. I mean, I've seen it so, I've been around the public sector and the private sector for the past 50 odd years. True. It, I don't think you're telling me the truth, you know, with that one there, with the, with the, with the years, because you don't look like you have to at all. And so for you to have been involved in this thing for 50 years, <laughs> much more than I think. Long time, you know, buddy. Look at brethren. My, my first job with the government was in 1971, right? So I go back over 50 years. Okay. And that was at the National Water Commission. You know, I've been around. All right. Anyway, the point I'm making, the point I'm making though, is that look, I any any job that I've been involved in, I try to make sure that we have a clear understanding with the political director that there will be no interference in terms of selection of contractors or selection of to be deployed. I can tell you the most sensitive job that I've ever had in terms of hiring a lot of people was when we reopened the alumina plant in 1985 when Alcoa closed it down in Jamaica. The minister at the time was Hugh Hart. And I had a very good relationship with him because it was clearly understood that people could not be appointed to be truckers or contractors in any way on, without them meeting certain basic criteria, which were established to ensure that there was no compromise. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, we had a very successful turnaround of that plant. And if you, if you look at it today, today we have a Jamalco, which is a 50-50 partnership between the government of Jamaica and Alcoa. But that came about because of the fact that when Alcoa closed down the plant, they were losing two million US a month. Wow. We took it and we turned it around and we made the last month I was in charge, which was May 1988, right? We made a profit of 7.2 million US dollars. And Alcoa was beating down the door to come back in to run their plant because we had made a hell of a success of it. All I'm saying is this that was possible because there was no compromising on things like choosing people who are for political reasons anyway. It was pure professionalism that ran the place. I'm saying that government and governments can run things very efficiently. If you toe the line in terms of separating the administrative role of management and that of the politician, and the politician must stick with dealing with laws and controls of regulations and all that, but not get involved in the deterioration and choosing people who are hired or fired. Yeah, before I turn it over to Herb, let me just say that Lisa made a good point. She said there should be a bidding process that is public to be fair to all contractors in the bid, that nobody stands a chance if they do not know the MP. And that's true. It's 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 sad, but it's 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 true that if you don't know the MP, 
you're not going to get the contract. And who knows what goes on at you know, your relationship with the NBA goes on, you know? Well, you see, the, the, the way that the Contractor General's Department and the whole Integrity Commission is set up is to try and bring some order to the process of selecting contractors and, and choosing the people who can do the job best. Right. But we can't run into problems where there is political interference. And as I say, it's not something which was born yesterday or in the past 15 years. It's been going on forever. Yeah. All I'm saying is that I think we need to stop. We need to let the process and we need to get politicians to speak with making laws and regulations, but not getting involved in the day-to-day -day choosing of people who are tired, fired, or whatever. Okay. Herb. Yes. Hey, Bobby. Herb Nelson, how are you doing? Very good. All right. Good to hear that. Is there a spirit of selection in Jamaica where even acquisition thresholds are established for people who have non-performance or they have um, uh, darkened uh, CVs to present. Uh, in other words, they don't really have the background for the contract. And uh, best practices where past performance and management of contracts come into play. Is this something that is professionally done when the government is evaluating contractors? It is done. But what I'm saying is that even though the laws are there, the controls are there, the systems are there, you still get compromised situations where politicians will pick up a phone and call the person who is choosing a contractor and say, look, Mr. Brown is my party and I'm looking at work and I need to get this contract. He is qualified to do the job, and you need to you know, look at him favorable. Them must say, you know. Mm -hmm. But by the time them done raising the issues with you, you know that really, boy, you have to find a good way to say that you can't hire the person that has been recommended, which is not the way it should be. You understand? Yeah. The, the yeah. management should be unfettered in terms of making a decision on the basis of the qualifications and the experience of those who are bidding on contracts. Now, having, having said that, here in the U.S., if a contract is awarded to somebody that um, has um, qualifications that can be challenged, then with government contracts, they will receive a challenge from some sure. of the other bidders. Is that a process in Jamaica where a bidder or a procurement company can lay out their qualifications versus the other companies, especially if they have the background information on their past performances? All right, let me tell you, let me give you an example of a situation that I know about, right? Okay. A contract was tendered and three contractors put in bids. Usually what happens is that you have a technical assessment before you look at the financial situation. The technical assessment was done of the three bids that came in. One of them got 95% technical approval. One was 80% and one was 60 or 70%. And they said, look, they're only going with people who are over 75%. So they threw out one bid and just looked at the other two. Of the other two, one of them came in at $17 million and one came in at $21 million, right? Mm -hmm. The 80% man came in at $10 million, the 95% at $17 million. The contract was given to the $21 million man. And the logic that was used is that the estimate by the engineers and the contractors and aunt who, who requested the bids, their estimate for the job was $21 million. Mm -hmm. Even though the higher the ranked 
technical problem, man, putting a, a low amount for the for bidding on the contract. They rejected it. Now, when they were asked about why it was that this was done, because there was no there was no technical reason, and if the man is the lowest bidder, why not accept it? The answer was read clause number 5.2.3.2, which says in the final analysis, it is up to the minister to decide who gets the contract. Hmm. Now, with a situation like that, what you have is clear interference politically in a situation where the minister should not have the last word about who the contract is, is allocated to. So I'm saying that we, we still need to do work on how our contracts and how our tenders and our bidding is done. Mm -hmm. And we need to determine a way where we can have it far more um, objectively done and less yeah. compromised by political inputs. That is my feeling. You see, when you check it out, you know, everybody will tell you, IDB, World Bank, everybody will tell you, one of the biggest things that takes your gross domestic product down is losses through corruption. And you're talking about anywhere from 5 to 10% of GDP being lost on an annual basis because of corruption. In the case of Jamaica, it is pretty bad because we are ranked very low on the, on the scale worldwide mm -hmm. in terms of corruption, yeah. right? And we need to improve that. We need to get far more and far more uncompromising in, in terms of our governance, and that is across the board. Let me ask you this, Bobby. Um... I think it was 2020, or maybe, yeah, I think it was 2020. There was a study done, and it reflected that about 70% of the Jamaican population believe that they lived in a corrupt society. And when they said corrupt society, they included the government, uh, and by extension, the, uh, the police department. Now, if you have upwards of 70% of your population believing that the, the the country is corrupt it would seem to suggest that 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 concept of of corruption that acceptance is baked into the psyche of the problem when you have so many people saying so many is wrong country with the government as far as corruption is concerned but you don't see anything being done except you, you get platitudes you get nice speeches uh, from everyone in, in involved. What is your suggestion to address this issue that has been with us for a very, very long time? All right, number one, it has to start from the top. In other words, the top has got to set the example. Wherever and whenever there is a hint of corruption, it needs to be exposed and it needs to be, if it is necessary for people to be punished or to be uh, fined. The problem is that many the cases, what happens is that if a minister or some high up ranking official is caught with their fingers in the till, they are shuffled around they are not necessarily punished in any way that is major. And this has been something that has been happening for years. And it's, it's all the political regimes keep on doing the same types of things. You have somebody who obviously compromised. What you need to do is move them out. When you look at, when you look at Jamaica compared, for instance, to Singapore back in the 1960s, and you look at what turned around Singapore to be one of the richest and most successful countries in the world, and what has left Jamaica in a position of being still developing, is that they found a way to make sure that they had rules and regulations and there was no compromise. There was no fooling around with 
people who are going to be corrupt in any way. If you're corrupt, you go jail. We don't have that sort of system in Jamaica and we don't have the leaders that have committed to it. We currently have a situation where the Integrity Commission has said, look, we want the Prime Minister and we want the leader of the opposition and all the members of parliament, etc., to sign this code of conduct, which is that you will not get involved in A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay? Up to now, I think the, the leader of the opposition has signed it. I don't know who else has signed it. But the leader of the government, the prime minister, has not signed his cabinet. The commission is established by a government. Say, like, here are rules that we want. And then they just, you know, ignore it. It said from I think last year up to now, nobody in the government has signed it as, as I'm aware. That doesn't say none. You see what I mean? Okay. Well, let me... it has, it, 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 the, the examples must start from the top. If command down the bottom, they get away with all kind of something. And there is no detachment, you know. Millions of dollars were missing. For jam. This was discovered way back, back in 2016. And the, the, the case has not been fully ever. Your situations with the CM situations with the government. You know, it is a or some kind of, of chicanery or something. They have not been dealt with. You, you, if you don't deal with these things, it just, it stay there and it, you know, it make everybody look around and say, Cha, may as well join the club and become a compromiser and a thief and criminal as well. We, 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 must, we must stay from that sort of approach to, to governance and to run in the country. Well, Bobby, let, let me put the advocate here for a second. It sounds like you're telling something that not happened in Jamaica. It's political violating. And if, if it can go back to, I think, Maybe longer. Come across a record where a was jailed, and and I believe he was jailed because he stole farm workers' money and he refused to return the funds. But yeah, since that was then, about that was about 30, 40 years ago. Okay, and between then and now, you between then and now, it's safe to say that politicians have been engaged in 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 corruption. Uh, what level? I won't hazard a. But it's fierce at a level where we're, 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 so if it happened over the last 30, 40 years and we're talking about it, right? Because you, from what I gather from you, you're saying we, we need to do this, we need to do that. But a lot of it has to do with the government because it starts at the top. So let's put the government aside because I think it's safe to say that the government is not doing what it should be doing about, about uh, corruption. And not just this government, government spanning all the way back. The question now is this. What can non-governmental entities and private citizens do to force the government, any government, to the point where uh, the rules are followed and we can make a dent in the corruption index, not only in Jamaica, but globally? This is why it is necessary for non-government organizations, the private sector, and various other voices, the church and other voices, must insist that we move away from corruption and we move towards a situation where our leaders are going to lead in a way where they set the example and just into decision making with respect to things like that and all that. The way we people have got the pressure to make sure 
that by the rule which stop we have a we have a integrity commission all of these in place if you still have leaders who are play by the rules and follow the the guidelines that they themselves establish as, as people in a situation where it is compromised everybody is going to first things first there's a code of conduct sign it there is a need for people to submit their annual returns deal with it and get it approved move forward in a way where it shows that you are not just talking but you are actually implementing things which are ensuring that corruption is driven out of, of the management and operations of our country. But let me ask this question before I, I allow Herb, uh, Herb can jump in after this. What would you specifically advise non-governmental organizations and citizens to do? Because you said what we, you know, you say, well, we have to do this and we have to, but how do we getting uh, uh, donor agencies and donor countries involved how do we do it all of the above the fact is this that there is no one approach there are those who are going to want to take to the streets there are those who are going to want to write their letters there are those who are going to want to ensure that they sit on various committees that are not government organizations etc we all need to pull together if we are serious about future development sustainably of our country, we need to identify where things are going wrong. The things in place are insist that they be put in place that make them right. And it, it's not one hand can clap. It's not just government have to do it. It is all of us have to insist on it. And by the way, it takes two hands to clap in terms of corruption, right? Mm -hmm. You will always have, yes, the politician on one side, but the other side, you have a lot of private sector organizations and individuals who basically feed off the system. They are the ones who will pay the money under the table for them to get a contract or give some commitment, for instance, to a politician that, look, when you are going to run in this constituency, I will give you X towards your running. You know, there are ways that, they can pay them back. Right. And that, to me, is what we need to get away from. We need to have more transparency, and we need to have some straight-up politicians who are going to say, look, I'm running on the basis of my track record, my integrity, my honesty, my commitment to non-corruption. All right. All right. Herb, you want to go ahead, yeah. please? Uh, okay, thanks. Bobby, uh, I'll give you an example. Here in Virginia, where I am, in the U.S., a Virginia company bid on work in Iraq. And the, the, their bid was something in the region of 300 million U.S. What they did was, they, it's similar to what you spoke about, you know, the, the rating, you know, your tech. Uh, abilities and other management abilities. They actually won the contract, even though an Iraqi company, Iraqi American, had put together a company in Iraq and they built a hundred million on the same job. So what they did, they took the winning bid, 300 million, and they turned to the Iraqi company and said, okay, we will pay you 150 million to complete the job. So they're making right off the top 150 million and the Iraqi company, Iraqi American would make 150 million, not the 100 million that they had originally bid because they looked at their, um, uh, technical abilities as well, and adjudicated that they could complete the work. Since they had local labor and there, there were combat conditions, 
that the U.S. firm would hold have on a second. hard time. Hold on a second, hold on. Hello, caller, you're on the line. Yeah, I was I'm listening to the program. But we had the same thing here in America when Bush was president. Hold on a second, Herb. Yeah. Yeah, we have a, we have a caller here. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, we had the same thing here in America okay, when President Bush was president. And they had the, well, the war in can you Iraq. Hear, can you hear now? No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Bobby can't hear them. No, I can't hear anything. All right. All right. I'll, I'll take the question and then I'll, I'll leave. Go ahead. You said when Bush was president. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when Bush was president, they when they had the war in Iraq. And then. Call her, go ahead. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, you said when Bush was president and they had a war in Iraq. When and they had a war in Iraq, mm -hmm. um, Dick Cheney did give the contract to Allah Burton. Okay. okay. Yeah. So and 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 Cheney was was on the board of Allah Burton. All right. Um, Herb and Bobby, the caller said that when Bush was president and they had a war in Iraq, um, Cheney gave the gave the a contract to Halliburton and he was sitting on the board of Halliburton. Is that is that my correct caller? Okay. Hello, caller. Yeah, yeah. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what the caller is No, what? Go ahead. Is correct. No, what what the gentlemen they were saying they are saying that. Um, politician must come out of um, contracts. But we have the same thing here. Okay. They're saying that, uh, Bobby and, and, and Herb, the caller is saying that you guys are saying that, or we all are saying that politicians should come out, you know, stay away from, from, from getting involved in, con in contracts. But they were the same thing. The same thing is going on in the U.S. And they, they mentioned the example of Bush and Cheney and Halliburton. Um, Herb, you probably are well suited to address that. I'm very familiar. I'm very familiar. Okay, Carla, thanks. Listen to Herb. He's going to provide the answer. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. I, I, you know, Mr. Cheney himself was still on the board, right? Now, you're supposed to put everything in some type of uh, escrow account or what, what account is that they call it again, where you put it aside while you're serving. Oh, the, the trust you're talking about, like a blind trust. Trust. Mm -hmm. trust. Blind trust, yes. And and but Cheney kept um, pushing for and getting various contracts, like a security contract. Mm -hmm. Albert is an engineering company, but, but he won a humongous six hundred and fifty million dollars security contract, which they gave it to um, uh, Christ. They call themselves Z now, or or, but they had a, a very notorious uh, record in um, Iraq. For, for just killing innocent people. But, you know, there was this concentration of contracts with Halliburton, uh, Bechtel, and other uh, Republican-supported corporations. So we know that the U.S. doesn't practice, you know, you know, say, do as I say, but not as I do, because there was a critique by the State Department of uh, Jamaica and Jamaica's practices in which they accuse Jamaica of too much corruption in the procurement process. And keep in mind that there's a lot of US money that funds various projects down in Jamaica. But um, being that as it may, it comes back to what I was saying to Bobby a while ago, that different companies have different practices and even though that company was penalized for doing that, um, uh, the, the fact of the matter is all of these folks who think that they're much smarter than the system, it shows there's corruption in the system. And my question to, to Bobby, is there any way that that tech company or that acquisition you spoke about where 95% tech abilities a $17 million bid versus the 80% tech abilities with a $21 million bid, it should have set off um, red flags because it is 
an audit process that could have shown where What I'm saying is this, right? That the fact that you have a situation which says the minister has the right to choose or not choose, it's wrong. You need your control that that cannot happen. And it should. A technical and financial team is at a management level that is right. making decisions, not having a political person who says, boy, the reality is, you know, that the guy who put in this bid is a good friend of mine or a supporter of mine or whatever, and therefore I'm going to get the contract even though I'm have the, the, the higher bid. Mm -hmm. That should not come into things. And all I'm saying is we need to move away from those types of things happening. Now, yeah. what the caller was talking about right. a while ago, is the fact that this happens worldwide. It happens in the United States, it happens in Britain, it happens all over the world. But in order to reduce it, you have got to set up systems. In countries like Singapore, they made a conscious effort to wipe out that level of corruption. And you can see, as I indicated earlier, where they're from and where they are today. We need to take that type of lead that type of step where we are going to select people who are going to fight for anti-corruption and seriously commit to it, not just talk about it, but actually do it. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just make an announcement here that we're going to go through the commercial break. So for those of you on the radio side, um, you should go to the live stream, the TV side. And then you can catch you can catch the uh, the conversation uh, that's ongoing. Uh, there'll be no break uh, because we've got an outstanding guest here, and we want to continue with him. So again, uh, we're coming up on a commercial break at the top of the hour, but the commercial break will only be on the radio side. So please, if you want to hear the conversation through the radio break, then kindly go to the uh, the the, uh, the TV side, the commercial side, the live stream side. Bobby, let me let me and Herb, let me let me just make a comment regarding what the caller just said. No, I, I am, you know, I'm, I'm I wax and I wane between, you know, trying to make comparisons with between Jamaica and other countries. And and here is why: if you start making comparisons between Jamaica and other countries, and and it depends on the situation. Again, let me emphasize: it depends on the situation. You tend to kind of accept what's going on in. Jamaica, because you say, well, and it's going on in the UK. So what's the big deal if it goes on in Jamaica? And if that's the idea, then nothing will get addressed in Jamaica. So I like to look at Jamaica in a vacuum and say, okay, we have corruption. We, Jamaica, we have corruption. And so we have to deal with it, regardless of what's going on around us. We have to deal with it. The other thing is this we have instances in America where every year politicians are sent to prison. Every year. So I don't hear anybody talking about that. I don't hear anybody saying, well, you know, they send people, they send, they send politicians to prison in America. So, you know, it's okay then to send prison, to send politicians to prison in Jamaica. I don't hear that argument being made. So if you're going to make the argument that let's do a, let's do a comparison between what's going on in, 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 in America and Jamaica, as far as bad governance is concerned, then you have to raise the entire issue. And so you have to talk about the people who are being sent to prison. In, in 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 America, the politicians that are being sent to prison in Jamaica, and maybe Jamaica, uh, maybe uh, Jamaica should take a leaf or a page out of that book, as well as uh, they should take the hope from 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 Singapore. I've been to Singapore and I see I see Lisa also. She's been there, um, and and I see how they operate their system. So um, that's all I have to say about that. Herb. Yeah, let me interject. Um... Chase Halliburton made 39.5 billion US dollars on the Iraq war. And this was um, uh, Angela Young, International Business Times, came out with that. Cheney himself had a $34 million payday. So 
you know, you can see where, and, and there was a whistleblower who also exposed a $7 billion no bid contract that changed by Burton while he was in office. What Obama chose to do when he took over, he could have gone after these people and he could have gone after the Wall Street folks for the 2007, 2008 debacle. But he chose not to. He chose to concentrate on recovering the uh, economics of the country and moving forward. And he pre prevented his uh, attorney general from opening uh, widespread investigations into the war profiteering. You know, I, I take you back, there's a old Marine Corps general uh, who said war is a racket. So every time you go into a war, you can make money. You make money. It's racketeering. And 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 it's the worst example for Jamaica or any other Caribbean island to be able to follow. Yet still the State Department wants to tell everybody else how to act when they themselves don't correct the mess that's going on that involves uh these high ranking folks with the uh uh, where, where billions was uh, taken from the U.S. tree, and and you know a little bit of money uh, went back in. As a matter of fact, there was eight billion dollars flown over in C-141 aircraft that disappeared in the systems that they had in Iraq. There was a lot of payouts to the warlords and stuff. But, but I think that, the point. That, yeah, go ahead. The point you are making is very important. We should not be looking at what other countries are doing wrong and saying, well, you know, why not us as well? What we should be doing is looking at the countries that are doing right, right. and yeah. try to follow their example. And what we need to do is stop trying to say that, look, everybody has teeth, Jamaica teeth, no big yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. We must set a standard that is much higher for ourselves and begin turn. Look here, Jamaica has enormous resources, enormous skills, enormous talent. We have, we're one of the smallest countries in the world, but we have one of the biggest voices, whether it is in politics or it is in you know, sports or it is in music or whatever we choose to do well at. We can do well at. Some of our doctors in Jamaica are now running some of the top hospitals and, and all that in the United States and in England. The fact and Canada. The fact is Jamaicans are very good. The problem is we don't spend enough time cleaning up our home. We need to clean up our country and make sure that we stand out because of the example we are setting to everybody else in terms of our cleanliness, in terms of the approach that we take to politics, the approach we take to everything, and, and get some discipline in the system. If you look even at the way that people drive on the roads in Jamaica, it's crazy. But what? We just ignore it. The, the, what was discovered in New York and other places is that if you clamp down on some of the simple things, it cleans up the entire system. Yep. And you, 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 have to, you have to take it from the bottom and the top at the same time, but the top must lead. That is what I'm saying, that you, know, you, you can't just focus on the little man. You know, we used to hell a lot of you know, people just crazy. What you need to do is something going to this big way. And to be honest with you, we're not looking at some of the big teeth in that is going on. Whether the, most of it is white collar teeth. In. Well, you know what? Let me just uh, refer to comments here. Lisa said, it makes it wrong. Uh, so they're not they're looking up. This happens all. And and here's another thing.
it's our so and Cheney, what are we talking about going on in the And that's the fear we start doing. Start talking about the in somebody else's birth. And at the same time, we're ignoring what's going on in there. So what we need to do, as just Bobby and, and, and Herb too, is need to look at in some bad countries have good examples depending on what you're looking at. Let's look let's look at if we can once you start making things that are corrupt, then there is no there is no there is no rule. Always got a country like the US, for example, that some people and say, oh, you know, so I mean if it's done here, like you said, it's not a problem. Yeah. We're waiting we for need it. to come out of the all crabs in a barrel and pull down each other argument. Let us let us begin to look at how we can pull up each other and set standards that are much higher and aspire to be the best in the world in every respect possible. Right. Um, we're still waiting for our uh, third guest uh, of the night to join us, uh, Ms. Uh, Donna. Scott Motley, and I see Kevin working feverishly in the background, so she should be on um, soon. But I mean, I think what, that. What, um, let me ask you a question. Bobby. Let me ask you a question. Where, where, where do you see Jamaica? Give know what's going on. Uh, six, three, four, twenty-five. Hello, Herb. Yeah. Yeah. It looked like we've lost. We lost Bobby. Right. Okay. Well, you know, um, I, I, I probably one question about the companies that that did that bid. I didn't get a answer. As well now, as Mitch overruled. Committee that you have to review these companies. And with less Okay. Okay. What? Yes, we. we... Well, what were they asking? No, the, the 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 caller was just making a statement. Of, uh, former President Jimmy Carter is hospitalized. Um, well, is, is I think he's a hundred now, right, or close to it? Yeah, he's close to a hundred now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I see. I see. Donna is on, so I can say good evening, everybody. Well, yeah. does that mean that you're leaving? Is that what you're saying to us? Yeah, man. Give give Donna the the. Opportunity yeah. to well, Bobby, before you go, the one thing I was bringing up a while ago was there any redress to find out where that four million dollars went to? Did NIA or anybody else? No, that? no, when when the ministry that was responsible was asked, they just pointed to the clause which said that the minister has the final say. And that, so there's no follow up uh, and you can go to a contract and argue a case and all that. But look, the effect, you get a little bit older and with five years maybe you get some resolution. It really don't matter. Somewhere. Or yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it would require the contractor to have taken the matter before the contracts commission. And then the commission will rule whether something that is considered done. Uh, the, the particular contractor just didn't bother to test it. He just said, boy, 
I can't bother with this foolishness. Goodbye. All right. Look, Bobby, thank you so much for stopping by the discussion. Also very informative, and we look forward to having you again. Don't be a stranger, sir, and stay forever young. Yeah, man. All the best. You guys take pleasure. care. Pleasure, right. And keep, keep up the good work, all right? Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. No, and we're joined by none other than Miss Donna Scott Motley. She asked me to refer to her as Donna. At least the announcement. Um, so welcome to, to, to the program. And what I'd like to do is th there may be people, I'm sure there are people in our listening audience that they 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 maybe they have heard the name, but they really don't know much about the person. So what I'd like you to do is just give us an intro. Who is Donna Scott Motley? Thank you, Will. Hi, yeah. Herbie. Welcome. <laughs> and and of course, you see, so when it comes to charming women, the host cuts us out. So I <laughs> you to I'm really happy to be joining you this afternoon. Uh, who is Donna? That's such an interesting question. I don't know where to start. But let me say that um, my political adventure started uh, just after I left law school. I was actually a candidate for the People's National Party in the 1989 election. I ran in Central Clarendon against Mike Henry. Uh, I'm a lawyer. My law firm is Scott Borasing and Bonick. And big it up, big it up, big it up, big it up. <laughs> well, I was Scott Borasing when I ran against Mike Henry. So and I, I met uh, my husband, Elombe Motley, a few years after, where, while I was a senator and parliamentary secretary in, in, in charge of culture, Mia Motley, who is now the prime minister who, and who was a friend of mine, introduced us. We met on the 18th of March and we were married by the 26th of May and we have been married for 31 years. Big up, big up. So, Congratulations. 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 <laughs> um. I politics for a while, then I was reappointed to the Senate in 2005 when Mr. Mr. Patterson was still prime minister. He asked me to rejoin the Senate. And then I, I was reappointed in 2017 by Peter Phillips, who asked me to be leader of opposition business in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And then in 2020, I rejoined. I continued in the Senate, the leadership of my Golden as deputy leader of opposition business. So now I'm spokesperson for justice and information. Is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> very impressive you know what i've watched you so many times on some of the on uh, various press conferences and i'm always struck by your incisiveness and and your ability to the issue um a lot of people they have uh, politicians in general they they, they they talk about stuff in a fluffy manner with flowery language or whatever but you have this ability to just cut and go right to the issue and what i'd like you to do is cut right to the issue for us now and just tell us What's your what's your take on what's going on with this uh, this this the, the prime minister's involvement uh, in this in this investigation conducted by the Integrity Commission? Well, I want to start at a different point, if you'll allow me. The Will. floor is yours. And I want to start with um, when the prime minister was leader of opposition, and Richard Azan was accused by the then can, contractor general. Donna, can of, I tell you to hold on one second? I see a call coming. Hold on a second. Absolutely. Yes, Carla, go ahead, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Right. So uh, I was listening to Mr. Tom Tavares earlier. I was disappointed. You were disappointed with Mr. Tom uh, Tavares? Yes, I was disappointed because <clears throat> one of the first things that he said that he would not interrupt. In fact, he said at one point that he would not interrupt again. And then he kept interrupting, right. especially her. I'll tell you what. Um, if you if you have a question for 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 our current guest uh donna then let me take that question if you don't have a question then you and i can talk later on about the things for fun. all right so i'll call back okay Thank fair you. enough thanks all right sorry about that donna go ahead please that's fine mm -hmm. that's fine 
So, so Richard Hassan was uh, in the Ministry of Transport and Works, and he was um, the Contractor General. Found him guilty of constructing ten shops on the market co compound. Mm -hmm. You know, these were for vendors. He was trying to make it look better and give them some comfort. Mm -hmm. He did not, however, get permission from the parish council. And so he was being reprimanded by the contractor general. Then at that time, the leader of opposition, who was Andrew Hunas, said that he would not sit in parliament with him as long as he remained there. And he, he called on the prime minister. He says it was a far greater indictment on the prime minister in keeping Azan in our cabinet and giving the green light to her ministers that they can act in ways that breach public trust and faith and retain their positions in government. He, he is that ineffective over corrupt government. And I start at the point because I think it is important to show how uh, he as opposition viewed the whole issue of Mr. Zan not getting uh, parish council permission before those shops were constructed. I then go to Lisa Hanna. Lisa mm -hmm. Hanna, was was referred to the director of public prosecution by the contractor general for what was the nepotism and cronyism over the awards of contracts valued at $3 million to mm -hmm. persons in our constituents who were linked to the People's National Party. When, when the DPP ruled that she was not to be criminally prosecuted, mm -hmm. And, and the PNP said Ms. Hannah was exonerated. The DPP quickly came on the media and she said the DPP or a prosecutor has no power to exonerate anyone. When we put a ruling forward and we indicate that there's insufficient material to form the basis of a criminal charge, that is not an exa exoneration. We are just stating the law and the facts. And you will ask me why I start there. Mm -hmm because the accusations which were made at, to the, at the prime minister, the director of corruption prosecution found firstly, that although there was sufficient evidence to make out one of the charges, it time, too much time had passed. So she was not going to recommend that he be charged. There'll be any charges. And I'm going to come back to that one. I'm going to come back to that one because this is in relation to the award of contracts by the Ministry of Education while he was the minister. There were 10 contracts which were awarded to his comp the, a company which, which he was affiliated he said they were very good friends for over 20 years. Western Construction Limited. Only five were reported to the contractor general as is needed to do. And the contracts in all um, amounted to over 21 million. In relation to the National Works Agency, the contracts were from 2009 to 2016, and that was in excess of 33 million. So when she says there was, is, although evidence has been identified sufficient amount charges for the noted offenses, the prosecution would be hard pressed to resist an abuse of process application with regard to undue delay. What effectively happened is that because the Ministry of Education and the National Works Agency and also the Social Development Commission was not called to account, we couldn't know how it is that they got to award the contracts. Are you with me? Yes, yes. So then question them to say, but why did you give West, Westcon these contracts? Why were you giving Westcon contracts that were not tendered? Why is it that he was able to be awarded on the basis that he had the lowest bid? That's the Ministry of Education. And then we would go to National Works Agency and we would get an explanation as to how they got introduced to Westcon, for example. So we could really examine whether the prime minister had, 
had been using undue influence. We, we have not had that opportunity. There is one other aspect of this that I want to highlight. And that is the allegation which was made against him in respect to the disbursement of um, the disbursement of the the monies to Westcon to pay for the Christmas, which was being done in his constituency. This now is when he wrote to SDC in his capacity as member of parliament. He had, according to him, there was some Christmas work going on and he realized that the, the persons would not be paid prior to Christmas. So what he did was that he requested that SDC pay over the pay the money through Westcon so that Westcon would be able to disperse it to the persons who had done the work. When he wrote initially to SDC, he said that it was for work done. But in his interview in September 2022, because that is when the director of corruption prosecution interviewed him, he said there, there was not actually any work done. It was just to facilitate the payment. But I want to, well, I wanted to tell you what he said in that interview. And if you look at the report, it's from page 12 to 13. Mm -hmm. He was asked, did he, did he think there was any need to disclose his association? And he says, no, I don't think there needed to be disclosure. It would have been known by the SDC office that Mr. Garvin worked in my constituency as a project officer and organizer and would have worked with the SDC on projects for my constituency. Outside of the context of the emergency request by SDC, or if they were not aware, I could see a conflict of interest concern. Now, the, the director said that in light of new evidence, new material which we, she had, she was not going to recommend that any action be taken against him. But if you look at it, Will, mm -hmm. at the time when this incident took place, no payments were made to Robert Garvin. Mm -hmm. It was not Robert Garvin to whom the payments were made. The payments were made through a company called Westcon, who from no information which we have been provided with, can we conclude would have been known to SDC at that time. So are you with me on that? I'm with you. So, so his his defense that um, Garvin was well known to SDC is not viable. Now, you come to the question of other justification. Was there an emergency? I believe that it would have been extremely disappointing to persons to not get paid in time for Christmas, for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I believe that it would have created a situation in the constituency because people would have been upset and grumbled. But I cannot agree that it meets the standard of an emergency. And what I find interesting is that Westcon was willing to accept being a conduit for funds. Mm -hmm. so, so, so even though they had done no work or, or had anything to do with the project, according to the Prime Minister, they simply ran the money through their accounts. I don't know why I could have agreed to do that. And that is, in my view, uh, quite questionable. So I don't think that we should say, we should have the view that the prime minister has been exonerated. He has not been prosecuted, but he has not been exonerated. Now, it's interesting the way this happened, and this is what I think is leaving uh, an uncomfortable feeling, because the Integrity Commission report was actually tabled on Valentine's Day. February 14, the ceremonial opening of parliament. It didn't come to any kind of public attention until the evening of the 15th, when we saw that there was reference of to the uh, director of corruption prosecution the charges for, for her to have charges should be laid. By the Thursday afternoon, so this is the Wednesday evening, the People's National Party had a press conference this Thursday morning. And by the Thursday afternoon, it was being disclosed that there had been a ruling 
by the director of, of corruption prosecution saying that no charges should be laid against the prime minister. This is what I think has been concerning to the public and to the various entities. And it has in fact distracted from the breach which was committed by the prime minister. So nobody is looking at what he did and questioning what he did and questioning his own approach to matters such as this while he was in opposition. They are simply looking now at the integrity commission. What took place there? No. no I believe. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll just say finally. I believe that a leader has to lead not just by words, but, but by actions. And I don't think it's sufficient to say that, oh, it was a long time ago and it doesn't matter. I think it still goes to character and it goes to judgment. And it raises questions within the context of a, of, of a government that has been riddled by corruption. We still have no answers about the used car deal for the police force. That was, I think, the first act. We know about the $600 million bushing program, which took place in Southeast St. Mary during the by election. We know about the Trajam, where a, a min Minister Wheatley was removed as minister and never has returned to the cabinet. We know what happened to Royal Reed as Minister of Education and a senator. And I could go on and on and on. So, so the, how, how the allegations of corruption has been dealt with by the government is to simply remove people well, from office. Right. Or in some cases, just put them in Jamaica. Home. Hello. Hold on a second, Donna. Yes, go ahead, Carla. Why, why can I get you live in South Florida? Oh, that's a technical question, and I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a technical person. But I have your number. Oh. So I'll call you after the program and we'll set it up so that you can get me live next week. How about that? Because we only have a few minutes to go. Okay, you can call me, sir. All right, take care. Be well. Bye-bye. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Sorry about that. No, so basically, I, I don't know if you wanted me to go, you wanted to ask me well, any questions. Right? Yeah, so, because um, I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure we have a few questions based on the, the report. And I've, I've gone through the report. I'm going to go through it again. Um, just a, what I'll just do is let, yeah, Herb, go ahead. Question, uh, Donna, Mr. Yes. Garvin, wasn't Mr. Garvin the representative of ADMAT who purchased the properties for the prime minister in Beverly Hills? Hasn't that been established? I don't want to say because I believe so, but I have not checked. Okay. Uh, it's since this discussion, and I'm not the kind of person when I speak, <laughs> I have to speak with extreme authority and clarity. I, but I believe so. Arising out of that um, 18 degrees north program, it, I right, right. There's, there's no question about it. As a, as a very associate of the prime minister, there are, he has been a business associate in terms of being associated associated with companies with both. Both the prime minister and the prime minister's wife. I don't think that that can be challenged. That was uh, a, that was identified in the report from the Integrity Commission from the director of investigation. And the last thing, that, and I'll let Mr. Ratigan go ahead. I recall Dudos being the person who dominated the contracting scene on behalf of the Jamaica Labour Party and funding a lot of things on behalf of the party. Now, when did the prime minister's wife, an accountant, take an active role in construction, the construction business? Because it appears to me that, that happened after 2010, after Dulles was um, summarily um, uh, extradited from the country. I'm just trying to get a timeline here. Where, where, when did she become active in the construction business? Well, remember that uh, Mrs. Hunis never became publicly in the sense of uh, that kind of high profile until after her husband became prime minister. Right. So that her actions before were not really under any kind of public scrutiny. So when she came, when she became known to the public through being the wife of the prime minister, she became known as a contractor. 
and it's an established fact that she has done a number of contracts. One or two have been embroiled in some controversy. There's one at, at Redhills, for which I don't think there's a resolution yet. Right. Yeah, I recall that. But it's just interesting that she seems to have taken over a portfolio that Dudus himself uh, commandeered in the early days. I don't want to make that kind of link. Uh, I think it leads, that is really speculative. Okay. I don't want to, I, 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 this conversation that I'm having is, um, it's not a partisan conversation. It is aimed at well-thinking people so right. that they can analyze it for themselves and come to a conclusion. So I'm not going to make her, her that kind of quantum leap and make those connections where I really don't have a basis for doing so. Well, you might suspect that it is so, but I'm, I can't do that. Okay. Uh, well, I'm just referring to appearances. Okay, but thanks. Thank you much. I understand. I understand what you're doing, but I'm saying that. For well, me to wear that kind of partisan hat at this, in this conversation would not be helpful to uh, myself or this worker who want uh, so Donna, give us some, speak to us with some authority and clarity on this question. The, the prosecutor for the uh, Integrity Commission declined prosecution. And we may, we, 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 we may take issue with how she did it, why she did it. But yes. the fact that it was done. Does the B DPP have a role to play in this? Can they then say, okay, you know what? It's not double jeopardy or anything like that because he wasn't prosecuted. And we have the statute. We have the wherewithal. We have the right to move forward with a prosecution. Can the DPP do that? <laughs> well, that, that is a true one, Will. I am confident, extremely confident, that the DPP would not even entertain such a process or such a question. I am confident of that. In unlike how she approached the Lisa Hanna issue, where she came out very quickly and said, it's not an exoneration, my case file remains open. I am confident that she would not even contemplate this, this matter. Okay, well, let me ask you this question. Statutory. It's another question whether she will, but it's, but it's I think there would have to be some referral to her that her opinion would have had to be sought before she would be able to justifiably intervene. With, 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 with the others, like um, the Contractor General, it, it was brought under the Contractor General Act. The fact is that how the integrity commission was set up, it was really supposed to be the czar. Mm -hmm. And so different, it had different limbs to it. So you have, for example, the director of investigation, director of corruption prosecution, and the director of corruption prosecution has very similar powers to the DPP. So I, I can't see, based on how the statute, how the entire system was structured, that it would be appropriate for the DPP to get involved statutorily. Okay. Um because I'm, I've, I've given myself some work to look through the, the, the penal code to see if there's anything there that the DPP could use to prosecute the prime minister. Now, uh, I think it's similar to the police. Like people tell you that, especially with the SSL case, that they didn't, they didn't arrest uh, Ms. Panton because, or, or anyone, because there were no complainant. But part of the, uh, the, the JCF's mandate is that they can detect crime. And so you don't need to wait for a complainant. You could actually move against someone. Well, that's a very interesting observation because you are, uh, you are entitled to be arrested on a reasonable suspicion that you have committed an offense. And in this instance, on January 7th, uh, she gave a statement, gave a statement admitting that she had committed an offense. Now, what is even, let me, let me just take it a little further. Right now, the Joint Select Committee is 
considering a new bailout. Because the government is convinced that the only way you can control crime is to use very stringent measures and repressive measures. So one of the things that we are contemplating now is whether you can have pre-charge bail. And let me explain what pre-charge bail is. It is where a police officer suspects you, but does not have the investigative material to charge you. He can actually ask you to surrender custody, grant you bail, although you have not been charged, establish bail conditions, and those conditions can remain in place for six months. After six months, if he wants it to continue, he has to make an application through an affidavit to a judge in chambers who can then give you further six months. And if he needs for that to continue, then he goes before a judge in open court and asks for an extension. I raise this because what the government wants to do is for those people who have no protection, nobody, have no status in this society, they want to impose those kinds of conditions over a lengthy period in what they say is an attempt to control crime. But Gina, who admitted on Jersey to having fleeced um, several customers of millions and millions of dollars, was only charged yesterday because they said they did not have the material to charge her. But Are you understand? Yeah, but, said, but yeah, but the, 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 this bail act you're talking about says that you don't need you don't need the material. You just have to have a reasonable suspicion that a crime was committed. Yeah. You, you can you can and you can take the person into custody. Right. Grant and on the basis that you need time to continue your investigation. Mm -hmm. You can impose bail conditions. So, for example, you, you can't, you have to go in, you, you can't come out after six o'clock. You need to report to the police station twice per week. You're you can't travel. You know, that sort of bail conditions. Mm -hmm. You can't um, be in a, go to a particular community. Those are some of the bail conditions that a judge Im imposes. Now, what they're giving the police the authority to do is to actually impose conditions, even though you're not charged with any offense, while the police gets a lot of time to investigate. So you see the disparity. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say, that how this disparity, because she was just charged yesterday. Mm -hmm. That is over a month and a half after she confessed. Right, right, right. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. Um, is there well the 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 corrupt i'm not i was gonna call it a corrupt prosecutor but no it's a corruption prosecutor all right she she she, she one of the realized things she advanced for declining to prosecute was one of timeliness was one of staleness saying that it happened yes, the first one on you delay right no is there a statute of limitations for that no so what does no, she mean by? But she she let she actually um, said this is what she said mm -hmm. I, because I want to be precise. Mm -hmm. She says although evidence has been identified sufficient to mount charges for the notices, the prosecution will be hard to resist and use a false application with regard to she's. The defense but, and saying that based on a defense which would be available, she will not proceed. But what about in the this phrase in the interest of justice? Well, obviously, obviously, she did not think she did not want to press the charges and have a judicial decision as to where you go with it. She has determined that. There, there would be the defense and a defense which would be irresistible of abuse of process of the undue delay. Now, because of this, precisely because of the stature of the prime minister, I believe that it should have been placed before the court for the court to decide whether or not it ought to proceed. Mm -hmm. I have to say this, though. It was surprising to a lot of persons, and the Integrity Commission was um, congratulated on its boldness, the approach to justice 
treating everybody as equal when this recommendation was made. It was felt that the commission had fulfilled its mandate in doing so because it was unprecedented that anyone would recommend that a, a, a prime minister be investigated in this fashion. And because it is the prime minister, I thought that it was also important that he goes through a process be followed to ensure that that approach was confirmed by the courts. You see the point that I'm mm -hmm, making? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let the court say um, there would be abuse of process. You know, th that argument that she made, abuse of process, it reminds me of uh, something I think Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, once said that he was 100% sure that he wouldn't score a goal if he didn't take a shot. <laughs> he said, I was 100% sure I wasn't going to score if I didn't take a shot. Why Why? Why did she, well, I, I, I'm just asking this rhetorically. Why did she short herself? Why did she discount, give them, give them, um, give them uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt and also bring up their defense? It's their defense to make. You know, why is she saying that? Well, they're going to make this defense and therefore I'm not going to submit it before the court. To me, it's it's it it, it doesn't strike me as being sound well, a sound judicial decision. I think that the public is owed explanation on a number of things by the integrity commission on a a number of quest a number of questions arise as to how the approach which was taken in this matter. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that, as Professor Trevor Monroe said today. They need to have a press conference. I don't think it was sufficient to issue a media release where you, you're actually protected by the media release. I think they must face the press and answer questions which can clarify for us why some of the approaches were taken and why some of the decisions were made. One of the ones that bother me personally is the fact that even after the report was tabled, the same evening or early morning, the ruling could have been communicated. You see, there the report is actually dated October. The, the director of investigations yeah, mm -hmm. is dated October. The ruling by the director of um, corruption prosecution is dated January 12th. The submission was made to parliament February 14th. And I think in between that, we need to understand what was happening and what are the processes that uh, that the reports went through, if there are processes. Why was this delay with the report of the investigator? From October to January. From, from October to uh, January. Mm -hmm. Well, for, from October to whenever. And the ruling was January 12th. Why the delay to February 14th? Mm -hmm. Why was it that the report of the investigator was not tabled until February 14? Well, what do you make of uh, what do you make of the the uh, integrity commission's position that under the law that they're required to take to, to to provide to Parliament the report of investigation first, followed by the decision of the prosecutor that you, you can't do both of them at the same time and you can't put the prosecution before the report you put the report you submit the report and then you fall because argument has you know an argument has been made and was made here today as well by uh, by by uh, uh senator uh, uh tom uh, finson um so uh, tom virus finson that uh the they should have been submitted at almost at the same time so that people could look and say okay we see the investigation but we also see the decision not to prosecute what do you make of the, that argument that one has to go before the other it's not a new argument for the integrity commission they have consistently said that the 53 section 53 one, 3 which directs them to act in this manner yeah is a gag clause mm -hmm. because what it does prohibits from say anything about investigation before the report is tabled mm -hmm. from any discussion any comments and so on and they have been persistent in requesting that that gag clause be removed the parliamentarians 
have been saying, listen, when you start cooking on that we have done, our reputation is impaired. And it might turn out that there's absolutely no evidence against us. Mm -hmm. So they have refused um, so far, so far, because we are still hearing um, submissions to remove, to, have to remove in that gag clause. But there is another section that I think they could have used. And that section allows them to deal with the matter as a, as, as a special um, investigation and gives them some more latitude as to how to approach it. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to use 36, you know, because they really don't want to um, have this discourse before the tabling of the report. Mm -hmm. My challenge is that after the report was tabled, the ruling could have been, once it was tabled in Parliament, within hours after, since it was available, it could have been made public. Okay. Herb? Yes. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, Donna, that we see certain perceptions, like, you know, the integrity coming running the clock, a term we use in football here, American football, where a team moves in the lead to prevent the other team from scoring, runs the clock out. Yes. And and it seems like with these charges, she's she just ran the clock out and she said, "Look, I'm running the clock out. I'm not going to do anything for now." Are there any parliamentary committees that? And I thought the opposition was running the uh, parliamentary committees that investigate uh, various activities. Is, is there one available to investigate this? We have an oversight committee for the Integrity Commission. Uh -huh. let, me, let me say, Herb, that one of the things that the Prime Minister Andrew Holmes did on was that the chairmanship returned to the government members. Uh -huh. Olin had actually introduced the concept when he was Prime Minister because he felt that the Parliament would have an opportunity because it was driven by opposition members the parliament would have an opportunity for a more transparent and clear approach to be taken to to matters so the oversight committee is chaired by i think minister ed bartlett and the oversight committee does have the remit where they can call in the integrity commission and get a, a hearing i mean be, be apprised of what has happened and how this has evolved. So there is a parliamentary committee, yes. It, it, there are methods that can occur where a private citizen can effect uh, a lawsuit or even the prosecution themselves. I thought that's how far as where uh, a citizen with the cooperation of the DPP's office, in certain cases. So, so, so the DPP would can grant a fiat, right. a fiat for prosecution. Can, can the attorney um, a fiat that is permission to prosecute in a particular matter? But the DPP would be very cautious about the circumstances where that would be permitted. Not done frequently is done after long examination and scrutiny and application of their term not, not it's not an everyday sort of um position because this the dpp has been given constitutional authority to deal with such matters you know in a situation like this where you need some semblance of independence you want to clear the prime minister's name and you want to clear up the circumstances under which this has occurred. There's just too many things hanging in the balance for her to run, uh, for the uh, other prosecutor to run the clock down on this. And I would think that, you know, if, if there was an approach by a member of the diaspora to come in and say, I need that fiat uh, to be able to enact this prosecution, 
that the opposition will support at least. And um, what do you think, Mr. Rattigan? You think you could handle that? <laughs> Who's <laughs> not to handle? <laughs> yes, that is that's happened. There's been a complete and total shift now because the Minister of Information has said, as far as the government is concerned, the Prime Minister has been exonerated. And so they have closed that chapter. They had a jubilant celebration on Friday on his return to the island. And as far as they're concerned, that chapter is closed. So now the scrutiny from everybody has turned to how the Integrity Commission functions. Let, let me let me just interrupt you just to let the uh, uh, listening audience know because I was muted that the question I just posed to Donna was that there seems to be a shift uh, in, uh, in terms of focus that the focus was moving at least on the part of some people and organizations to the Integrity Commission and not the, and away from the Prime Minister and so she was providing an answer. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, finish up, Donna. Yes, well, I had really finished my comment okay. on that point. Um, let me tell you, citizens have to determine what kind of country we are going to live in. You know what? Let me stop you right there. Let me tell you. Talk, talk to the people. Him. Forget that there. Talk to the people. Him. As if you, are, you, are, you, know, you, are, you are pour out your heart <laughs> and your soul and your experience and you oh. explain to them what. Talk to them. So what I did was I looked at the comments on the, the prime minister's Um, when the Prime Minister was to DP. And I also looked at the comments on the, the investigation into SSL. And what I found is that the majority of the comments were not now go, go, come out, 91, well, we're moving right along, and so on. And people have the view that in certain instances, they will get no justice, that there will always be cover ups in certain instances. So I would say to people that they have a choice. They actually have the matter in their hands. And I will go back to Richard Azan. People demonstrated against Richard Azan remaining in parliament. People went and they agitated. Civil society was vociferous in circumstances where they did not say he got any personal benefit, in circumstances where it, it was that he built the 10 shops without permission. So as a result of that, he had to step down as Minister of State in the government. And it shows to me the power, the power of a citizen in demanding change and demanding accountability. So that I am of the view that rather than institutionalizing the fact that nobody does anything or the fact that there's a different sort of justice depending on who you are and what you do. Citizens need to impact the processes and call for justice and equality for all. If citizens make their voices heard, they have to be listened to. Mm -hmm. They can make the difference in what sort of country we live in they can actually impact uh, and create a Jamaica where we don't say, I saw it go. Mm -hmm. So it's a black country, it's a corrupt, everybody corrupt, a politician corrupt. They can hold their politicians account and ensure that when there are allegations of corruption surrounding their politicians, regardless of whatever side, that they are fully ventilated, satisfactorily ventilated and justice it held, that justice is done because the appearance that just that there's an injustice is damaging to a, a society okay um let me just ask you we have five minutes left i'll just ask you a quick question and then, and then i'll uh, her can jump in um 
it appears to me that what this prosecutor has done is that she's provided now all politicians with the defense of saying abuse of process if it's been if the investigation was conducted a while back um what are your feelings about that clearly any politician or any person who is being investigated by the integrity commission is going to take advantage of that Mm -hmm. now the truth of it is that there are a lot of legacy investigations left over from the contractor general's time Mm -hmm. and look at the investigations even the one there were two recent the mombasa grass uh oh yeah yeah, i know about that Mm -hmm. implicated carl samuda yes by the time the report was tab- tabled, it was a damp squib. And Carl really said, but, you know, that is no longer relevant because, in fact, there had some, uh, uh, had been removed as minister for, for a while. And, like, he, he served, uh, uh, he served some time, mm-hmm. is what he said. Like, it's no longer relevant. And so we must find a way to ensure that these investigations are speedily conducted so that they can have an impact on what next is done. There was also the J.C. Hutchinson report, integrity report. Again, it comes so late that it's, I I don't even know if people bother to read it. Mm -hmm. So, from what it seems to me, it's like we're 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 down that slippery slope. So now everybody's going to use that defense to say, "Hey, it's an abuse of process because this happened a while back," and 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 so you know, doing it now, um, I'm going to raise a defense. And and then what is the poor prosecutor to 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 do? I mean, there is no justice as far as I, think, I don't think they would even have to raise a defense now because there's this this anybody any perp even if it's not her. I, I think they would have to be influenced by this decision okay. of abuse of process. Herb, you, play. Herb uh, you have time for one quick question, and then we have to close up shop. Okay. Uh, you know, Donna, I r- recall there was some... Uh, and the expectation was they're going to think like a mother. They're going to act as if the you know the monies that transition the company, the country rather, belongs to them. They would have more control, more eyes on the process, and have more to say, and speak up and speak out loud and clear. Now you're the only one I'm hearing speaking up and speaking out loudly and clearly. What I'm talking about other women that are in parliament that uh, should have impacted Parliament and made change. <laughs> well, you, we, some of us are disappointed that we have not seen the advantage or any benefits from having f- this amount of women in women, which are um, compared to other years. But I am still hopeful that the Women's Parliamentary Caucus, which got off to a very negative start, uh, we are going to, we are scheduled to meet again in March. And I am hopeful, I'm hopeful that we can see a difference. But I, I must tell you, well, there are a few seconds left. As hopeful as I am, I am very doubtful. All right. We have because to end. Let me just thank again, Tom Tavares Fins, my um they're saying that uh, you breath of fresh air and uh they will you back the thing so uh, but those of us one like live stream uh uh they're actually with well thank you again for coming and while well, there's anything we can do from the diaspora please please do you know, not hesitate. This place, make this place. It's your home. It's a pleasure to join you and to 
I'm sorry I didn't get to hear from your list directly, but it was a pleasure to join you. We'll fix that the next time you come up, you come along. <laughs> All right. You know.